We're going to start in the middle of what we just read. Look at verse 15. And look out for the, the phrase he repeats twice. Paul says, The spirit you received doesn't make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. Now grab that phrase that he repeats. The spirit you received. As Christians we believe God is one God in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And when you become a Christian, you can say, God the Father loves me, God the Son died for me, but the one we're going to focus on this morning is, God the Spirit lives in me. A gift of the gospel is that he gives God's Holy Spirit to you. You receive him. When you repent of your sins, you receive the Spirit. When you put your faith in Christ, he puts his Spirit in you. The life breath of God living and breathing in you. So, this person of the Spirit renews me so that I'm not who I was before. And the person of the Spirit leads me so that I go in directions I didn't go before. And the person of the Spirit empowers me so that I can do things that I couldn't do before. The way I want you to think about it is the Spirit begins a real and a renewing relationship within you. The Spirit is not like a battery pack or an energy force. He is a person. We've got a whole bunch of people in our church that work in school. I think three of them are PSAs. A PSA is a pupil support assistant. There are some kids with additional needs who find the classroom a challenging place to be. And those kids can sometimes make the classroom a challenging place for others to be. What do those pupils need? They need the support of an assistant. They need a person who will walk beside them, sit next to them, calm them, restrain them, help them, focus them, be with them. They need a person. They need the support of someone who will, because they're right next to them, stop them from doing the things they shouldn't be doing and help them flourish in the things that they should be doing. Now, I use that illustration because that personal aspect is what Christians have in the person of the Holy Spirit. It's a PSA, not as a pupil support assistant, but in the powerful Spirit's assistant. And that real and renewing relationship is what every Christian knows and what every Christian needs. And what Paul wants us to remember today is remember the spirit you received. Like a pupil who was struggling when they were alone, who is now helped by the presence of a PSA, a Christian is in a real and renewing relationship with God, the Holy Spirit. And what I want you to do this morning, if you're sat here listening for the next 20 minutes, I want you to be asking yourself questions like, have I received him? Do I know that realness and renewing of the life breath of God in my life? Because the early chapter of Romans said, listen, Christianity is not an external, empty religion. It is this real and renewing relationship. And I want you to ask yourself the question this morning, do I know this? And uh, we're going to look at this through two words, obligation and adoption. And I'm going to show you how they relate. But actually, this obligation we're going to look at first flows from the truth that we are adopted. So, first word obligation. Look again at verse 12. 
Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but not to the flesh, to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you'll die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. So he's speaking to brothers and sisters, he's speaking to the church family, and he says, you have an obligation. You have a responsibility. You have a calling. You have an indebtedness. But before he tells them what it is, he is keen for them to realize what it is not. He says, it is not to the flesh. Now to understand what the flesh is, um, another way to think about it is to think of it as your sinful nature. Um, take the first two letters of that. Sinful S, nature N. Your sinful nature has I in the middle. Sin. That's the problem with your sinful nature is it has a tendency to put yourself in the middle of absolutely everything. Get that idea? You spell? S-I-N. The sinful nature has I in the middle. I try and make everything revolve around me. I try and make everything about me. I am my biggest problem. I am the one who wrecks creation, wrecks relationships, and that I is what leaves my life in the rubble. It promises much. Make everything about you. But verse 13, if you live according to the flesh, the sinful nature, putting I in the middle of everything, he says, you will die. Now, some of us may be sat here this morning and are following the pattern of this world, living with I in the middle of everything. And maybe from a worldly point of view, you have everything you could ever want. But you still feel empty. It's trying to hint to you. If you live for the I, it will never satisfy. Some of us might be the opposite end of the spectrum where we've been living for the I and living for the I has meant we've lost everything. But we're still living for the thing that stole everything from us. There's a sense which what we're saying to you this morning is that obligation to the selfish I is the thing that needs to die. And Paul is speaking to brothers and sisters to a church family saying that sinful nature with I in the middle, you owe it nothing. Don't live for the thing that brought death to everything. Uh, Back in chapter 6, verse 21, one of my favourite questions in the book of Romans. He says, what benefit did you reap from the things that you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. He's saying, you have no obligation to the things that brought you no benefit. Don't live for that. But so, he says, okay, that's what the obligation is not to. That sinful nature that has I in the middle. But what is the obligation to? He says, but if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. It's interesting, he says, there is a way of life that brings death, and there's a way of death that brings life. If you want to truly live, that I must die. Now, doesn't that stand out from everything and everyone in the pattern of this world? Everything and everyone says, you define your own I. And you then promote that I and pleasure that I and protect that I and do whatever you can for that I. Whereas Jesus is saying, if you want to truly live, that I must die. That selfishness must die. It struck me this week, if you were there on Tuesday in the Bible studies, in Romans 8 through 5, there is so much language of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. I think that's significant when you think of the sinful nature being defined by the eye. At the center of this universe, behind everything in this world, is not a God who is a selfish eye, but is a God who is a tri-unity. He is by nature not selfish, but self-giving. The 
Father gave his Son for you. The Son gave his life for you. The Spirit gives the power of God to you. And what Paul is saying is the reason why we need to put to death the, the misdeeds of the body, this sinful eye, selfish eye, is because he wants to renew us into the image of the self-giving God. The eye must die. Which means, if we ask the question, what is your biggest struggle with sin? In some ways, everyone might give a different answer. But in reality, we all have the same most significant sin struggle. Pride. That we prioritize and pleasure and promote the eye. And actually that pride of the eye is what lies behind all the misdeeds of the body. So think about why do you get angry? I get angry because other people's eyes are challenging and getting in front of my eye. See how it all relates to that? Why do we abuse substances? To give my eye the escape that I think it needs. Why do I look at pornography? Because I think I need to give my eye the pleasure that it deserves. Or why do I lie to try and give my eye the cover it needs from being exposed? Why do we spend way too much money on material things? Because we're trying to protect and cover the eye from the deep sense of insecurity that it feels. All the misdeeds of the body flow from the pride of the eye that's at the heart of our sinful nature. You see how the eye is the issue? And that means if the eye is at the heart of the problem, I cannot be at the heart of the solution. That's why Paul says, he doesn't say put to death the misdeeds of the body. He says, by the Spirit, put to death the misdeeds of the body. I can't do this myself. I can do this by the Spirit. And it's the Spirit who empowers me to be ruthless with sin. And we're not good at this. We tend to cuddle our sin rather than kill it. We tend to feed it rather than fight it. But Paul doesn't say put it to bed. He doesn't say put it away. He says put it to death. Let's think for a couple of examples. If you had a young lassie who was really struggling with um, the insecurity of how she felt about her body, maybe that had taken her into an eating disorder really struggling and she's trying to fight that but she is still watching weight loss videos on TikTok and binging housewives of high bits and watching endless photoshop stories on Instagram what would your counsel be to her? don't feed those thoughts starve them And by God's Spirit, the Spirit you receive, put them to death. If you live like that, it will bring death to your mind. Take another example. The person who's trying to stop smoking weed. Desperate to stop. But they've still got their dealer's number in their phone. They've still got a grinder in their house. And they've still got no accountability on the day that the door money comes in. What would you say to that person? Listen, don't create easy opportunities to go back, but count the cost and cut it off. By the spirit you received, put it to death. Don't cuddle it. Don't feed it. Kill it. Starve it. You'd be ruthless. Ruthless with the misdeeds of the body. However, 
uh, in some ways isn't enough because the misdeeds of the body have their roots in the desires of our hearts, don't they? Uh, I've been doing some work in the garden this week. I'm a rookie gardener. But here's what you learn. If you want to get rid of weeds, you don't just need to get rid of the bits of the weeds you can see. You need to get rid of the bits of the weeds that you cannot see. You have to be ruthless with the root. And all the misdeeds of the body have their roots in the desires of our hearts. Which means it's not just about putting to death what I do, but it's about putting to death why I do it. So think again about the last thing, because we're insecure about our bodies. There could be a million things that are going on, but what is it that makes us concerned about how we look? Because I want my eye to be conformed to what the world likes so that I might gain the world's applause. That's the eye that we need to put to death. That it's no longer about the promotion of the eye, but it's about the promotion of Christ. That's what needs to change in my heart. Think about the person who's talking about smoking weed. Why is that? It's because the eye has learned to believe the lie that it is the only pathway to peace. And that what matters more than the good of my family or adherence to the law is that I can get the eye to that high. We need to attack the lie. And by the Spirit, put to death this lie that it is my right to walk the broad road that leads to destruction rather than by the Spirit following the hard road that leads to true peace with God. You see, it's not just the what and the weeds, it's the why and the root. And we need the Spirit to put to death that pride of the eye. And this is what he does. He is the PSA. He is the power and the person within that helps us be ruthless with our sin. So let me ask you, have you experienced that? Have you known this Spirit's power in this real and renewing way that is helping you be ruthless with your sin? Some of us here are believers and maybe we've tried so many different ways to try and change but it's never worked. It might be because we've just been trying the what and we've not been addressing the why but it's more likely to be that we're still trying to depend on the I to bring change. But if the I is the problem the I will never be the answer. And what Paul is telling us in Romans is you need Jesus to forgive you for everything in your past and you need him to put his spirit in you to bring any hope of change for the future. It's not about I trying harder. It's about the spirit you receive empowering us within us. Does that make sense? Our obligation. It's not to the flesh. It owes, we owe it nothing. But our obligation is by the spirit to put to death that selfish heart. Now, that's the first word, obligation. If you only listen to the first half of the sermon, it's going to feel really heavy. You need to see how this first word connects to the second one. And I want to show you now how our obligation flows from our adoption. So have a look at verse um, 14. For, okay, there's the connecting word, for. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The spirit you receive doesn't make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship and by him we cry, Abba, Father. And the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. So here's what you need to say. See, our obligation flows from our adoption. The word obligation on its own feels very heavy. Some of you might have a version of the Bible that the word it uses is debtors. And debt isn't just heavy, it's hostile, isn't it? 
walk into our Bible study group on Tuesday night, I met an old wifey from the scheme who was telling me that because all the kind of benefit stuff has now gone online, you can't really meet a person and speak to them, it's meant she's got in such a state with her benefits that she is horrendously in debt. She was at an end of herself speaking to me, and she, she, the language and the picture she used to describe it was imprisonment. Now, that is some people's view of Christianity. It's a straight jacket around your life, and it's a heavy burden on your back. It is slavery to fear. But what we need to see is, that is not Paul's vision of this obligation. In verse 15, Paul starts again with what the, this relationship is not. Look at verse 15. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live again in fear. Now that word again is significant. He's saying that before we lived in the spirit, we lived in fear. Paul's assessment of every single human being is that by nature we are slaves to fear. Now, there's not many lads in our community that would admit that. We try and hide our fear. But most of what we do is trying to hide from the things that we do fear. Fear of missing out. Fear of not fitting in. Fear of not standing out. Fear of not being perceived as being successful. Fear of being alone. Fear of dying. Fear of being caught. If that's you, even though you might not believe this next bit to be true, I hope that you want it to be true. Because this is beautiful. Look where he goes next. Middle of verse 15. Rather the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship and by him we cry, Abba. Living as a Christian is not the heavy obligation of a slave. It is the happy obligation of a son. Romans 8 did start in the kind of high court with language of justification and the picture of God as a judge. But we've transitioned now from the high court to home comforts from language of justification to language of adoption, and from a picture of God as judge to a picture of God as father. This is a tremendous transition. This is what he's saying. I ought to have been condemned by God. But in Christ, I've been made a child of God. I ought to have been alienated as an enemy of God. But in Christ, I have been brought into adoption by God. I ought to have been banished to hell. Instead, he has brought me home. And he has made me an heir. Which means, this is not the heavy obligation of a slave who's constantly questioned whether or not they've done enough to please the master. No, it is the happy obligation of a son who deep down has been convinced that there is nothing they can do that would make the father love them less and there is nothing they can do that will make the father love them more. I've got a whiteboard in my study and one of the things that's written on it that tries to keep my head in the game is you can live for the father's smile or you can live from it. What a difference to know. I don't have to try and work for my father's smile, but I can live constantly from his smile. He loves me. And that is the purpose of the Spirit's presence in your life. He is given to you by God to make sure you know that you are a child of God. I know most of you fairly well, and I know for many of us, we know the agony of an absent father. But 
the purpose of the Spirit in your life is to make sure you know the most intimate of relationships with the most incomparable of fathers. I was chatting to one of the Hearts players a couple of weeks ago and he was telling me that the day before his little daughter had been going around her nursery class asking all the other kids what football team their daddies played for. And all of them were like, he's rubbish at football. This little girl had no idea of the privileged access that she had to a guy that plays for Hearts in Scotland. She just presumed everyone had that kind of relationship. We forget as believers the beautiful access we have to someone who's better than a professional player. He is Father God, creator of the world. And he says, by the Spirit, you can cry out, Abba, Father. Abba is barely even a word. It's an infant sound that comes from the cry of a little baby. I like to think I'm more mature than a little baby. I'm not. But he tells me that I'm safe in his hands. I like to think that when I pray, I do more than just babble, gurgling noises. I don't. But he loves to listen. And the Spirit helps us to pray, Abba, Father. Now, some of us find prayer hard. Some of us might have been neglecting prayer. But the answer to that is no. Try harder. It's to ask the Spirit for help. And the answer is no, that there's more about prayer that you need to learn. The answer is you need to realize more how much you are loved. Don't think about prayer like a slave. Think about prayer like a son. Enjoy the blessing of prayer. You may have had an absent father but don't be an absent child to your Heavenly Father. It is closeness with Him that will keep fear far away. Abba Father. That's what the Spirit empowers, this speaking to God. But it's not just a one-way thing. This is one of the most beautiful things, and you may never have seen this before. Look at verse 16. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now I said that we've gone from the high court to home comfort, but actually this word testify takes us back to the courtroom. The Holy Spirit testifies. He promises to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And what is the truth that he tells? He tells you that you are God's child. What is he testifying? He is testifying that God doesn't just love you. God wants you to know that he loves you. The Spirit testifies that you're not just a child of God, but that God wants you to know deep within your being that you are a child of God. Do you see that? Where does he testify? In our spirits. He testifies to the deepest part of you, the you at your most you the bit of you that gets most anxious and most fearful and most doubtful. He speaks to the part of you that is most likely to feel like a slave. And he testifies that you are a son or a daughter of Father God. The Spirit is given to you so that you might know that you are a child of God. Now, how does he do this? How does the Spirit speak to us? I think there is a sense in which he does this through the Scripture. The Spirit who inspired these words takes these words and he implies them deep within you. I think that is part of it. But I say this carefully, our awareness of God our Father doesn't just come from the external written word. It comes with an internal testament 
Now, we need to be careful with feelings. Because sometimes my feelings just come from the dodgy curry I had the night before. Sometimes my feelings just come from the emotional state I've worked myself up into or the way that my circumstances can manipulate me. So we need to be careful. But this testimony of the Spirit isn't just in the old way of the written code. It's in the new way of the Spirit. It is in the depths of my Spirit. And what God is saying in here is that his spirit may come, maybe in the still, small voice. Maybe in the words of a song that just melt your core. Maybe in a sermon when you feel cut to the heart. Or maybe just in that moment of intimate prayer. The spirit speaks deep within your spirit and he makes you feel that assurance that you're his child. I don't think it's a wrong thing to pray. Spirit. Testify to my spirit that I am an adopted son of Jesus. Now the final question I think is worth asking is, when does he do this? And I think in the field and the floor of Romans, there are two particular times when he does this. He does it when killing sin is costly, and he does it when following his lead is costly. So I think the Spirit's testimony often comes when we are feeling the weight of the obligation. And when killing sin is costly, that is when he often testifies we're his children. When we're living out this obligation, he testifies loudly of our adoption. But it's also when following his lead is costly, he tells us that we are his children. I think if you're in a season of particular suffering, that may be a moment when the Spirit comes and speaks this sweet word of adoption. Now, he might not do this all the time, but he will do it at times. And he might not do it when we want, but he will do it when we need. That God the Father and God the Son, through the presence of God the Spirit, in the privilege of our obligation, will testify deep within you that you know the sweetness of his adoption.